Some of you, Miss Sharon is um, is a dedicated person for conservation of um, of the earth, especially of of the animals that we see here in front. She is uh, also a Hong Kong actress. Uh, you can now search for her movies online. I'm sure you. Can. It's a statutory holiday, and you decide to spend your time here together. I think it's wonderful. So, um, yeah, Brother Dennis mentioned that, yes, I, I have done some films. Uh, when I was in Philippines, I remember I met some uh, actors and actresses there. There was Rachel Ambanco, I don't know whether you know who she is. There was a Patrick De La Rosa. There was a Cecil Montano. Yes, and uh, so, yeah, we, we hung out. And, um, so now, I'm here today to talk about conservation and how it relates to us, I guess. Um, I started doing conservation work without realizing it. I think when I was about 20 years old, um, I started getting involved with chameleons. So chameleons are very slow moving reptiles that are very, very hard to breed. If they're not happy, they can die in a day. They will just turn around and they will die. Some of them will commit suicide in in like hundreds, okay? They will all climb a tree and just drop. So it'll be raining chameleons and then they all just die. So it depends, and sometimes something to do with the weather, something happens, the whole group of them, they're not happy, they will commit suicide. So about um, 30 years ago, over 30 years ago, I went to places like Madagascar and parts of Africa with uh, some friends of mine. So there were a total of four of us, crazy people that decided, let's do something to save this animal, because otherwise it will be wiped out from the planet. And now Madagascar is shaped like a leaf. If you look at the map, you can Google and see Madagascar is like a leaf. They have destroyed Madagascar in such a way that basically they're burning the leaf from west to east. So now there's only the edge of the east side of the leaf that is still kind of okay. And all this is because of exploitation money under the table, you know, and you know, people getting to buy the land, to clear the land, making palm oil for palm sugar, things like that. So what can we do in our daily lives? Now, your choices that you make every day actually make a big impact on the planet because it takes all of us to work together to make changes, right? It's many drops in one bucket, right? You know, no one person can make all the difference. So whether you choose using the straw or not, using the plastic bag or not, okay, you use a plastic bag. Use it more than once, use it 10 times. Use it until there's a hole in it. Keep recycling, keep using, all right? So when you buy candy, like if you get a bag of, let's say, M&Ms, right? And look at the back. If it says um, vegetable sugars or vegetable oils, but it doesn't say what kind, it will be palm because it's the cheapest one. And so you know that when you buy that, you're supporting the industry behind it. And a lot of the big bosses, they don't really even know what's going on. You know, I go to the boss at Swire in Hong Kong, and say, hey, you guys are supporting uh, palm oil plantations in Sumatra. I said, no, no, we're not doing that. Said, yes, you are, I was there. Because you know, it goes down so many levels, and the people down there are doing things that the big bosses don't know sometimes. So, each of us can make a difference. I try to make noise, like I find out things, I tell the people that can have a right to make changes and they make changes. Um, now we're here today to talk about animals though, mainly. Um, I, after doing chameleons, uh, I got involved with other conservation things, again, without realizing it. Now chameleons though, we were able to bring 38 species into America and breed them successfully. So we sold to people at that time, although I didn't make any money, um, we sold to people like Brad Pitt, Michael Jackson. So we yeah, actually spoke with Brad Pitt on the phone and it was like, my partner was like, oh no, nah, you mean Brad Pitt? No, 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 no. You mean really, like the Brad Pitt? Oh my God, it's Brad Pitt. <laughs> oh, nah, nah, you're kidding. It's like, it was so funny. Cause she was like a big fan. 
But uh, these people, you know, they buy these animals. It's good that they have the money because they can then create greenhouses. These greenhouses are about the size of this room. In fact, it's about this shape. Okay, I, we started with about uh, 16 of these greenhouses in the desert in California. All we did was pump water into these greenhouses and we turned it into rainforest. And we let the animals go back to nature. Okay, so that's how we managed to breed them. The first generation, they don't like people. If they feel that they're in uh, enclosure, if they feel that the environment's wrong, they will turn brown and die. So it was not easy, but once we got the eggs, once we were able to captive breed those little hatchlings, then everything was more or less smooth sailing. Of course, we needed to learn more about uh, the nutrition and how to care for it, but that was easier. So what you see today in the pet trade, if it's chameleons, it was because of our work. Just four crazy people. We made a difference in one species. So after that, I met with some uh, amazing other people that are my idols, okay? Uh, I have a mentor, her name is Dr. Jane Goodall. She's a very well-known oceanographer. So on her spare time, she designs submersibles, like little submarines and things like that. Yeah. And uh, she, uh, she has a group called Mission Blue in America. And I went to the States, this was about maybe 15 years or more ago, to help with fighting the shark fin consumption situation. So I remember back in those days, you know, my mom's living in San Francisco. I tell her what I'm doing, I said, Mom, so uh, yeah, I'm gonna work on telling people not to eat shark fin. She said, what? I said, yeah, stop eating shark fin. She said, ha, you gotta be kidding. <laughs> Just, you're not gonna, it's not gonna work. You can never get the Chinese to stop eating shark fin. But today, we are down in shark fin consumption by 90% throughout the south of China. So it has been successful. And it's not the work of one person. It is the work of everybody. And the best thing is the younger generation are all falling into place. Now, we, we hear that say, eating shark fin is a bad thing. Please leave my hair alone. I don't need you to do my hair stuff. Okay. So we hear that um, eating shark fin is bad, but the math behind it, why, I think would be interesting to learn about. So it's, it's quite simple. If I was a businessman, all I wanted was to make money. Okay? Let's just say I have a ship, and my ship has a freezer, and it can hold 200 tons only. So my ship goes out for maybe two months in the high seas and it comes back. Whatever it has in the freezer is what I make money out of. Okay, so if I have a whole shark, that whole shark could sell for maybe seven to $10 US. The whole shark. If I have shark fin, that can sell for $700. Wow. All right, per, per, depending on the kind of fin. Yeah. So, that is why people have been doing what they've been doing. They go out there, the way they've been fishing sharks, they use long lines. Now these are, like when you go fishing, okay, those lines, but there's a bunch of them, because they don't want them to break. If one breaks, at least you should have many more. I don't need you to talk right now. So, um, so you, you have a bunch of these lines, and for every about 10 feet or 12 feet, there's another line going down, and there's a hook, and they put some lure there. These lines catch everything, from sea turtles to seagulls, sometimes even porpoises and small cetaceans like dolphins and things like that. Yeah, they just hook everything non-discriminately. So they're killing things that they don't intend to kill. But these lines go for about 400 miles. So if I was that ship, I would start putting the line down and it floats, right? Because there's floats on it. And I, the ship keeps going, the line keeps going, right? And by the time I reach the end, I leave it, I go back to the front, and then I start picking it up. And when I find sharks, I just cut the fin off and I throw the body back. Now, when we were fighting the shark fin trade in California, so we were doing this in state assembly, we were doing this in court, and they hired people, you know, big time lawyers with money, right? And you know the stories that they made up to argue, they were saying that sharks would grow their fins back if you chop them off, I said, this is not a lizard. This is a shark. Can we try doing that with your arm? <laughs> so, you know, they, they were just making up stuff to try to get their story across. They used everything, like Chinese culture. Uh, it's a cultural dish. 
I said, I'm sorry, you know, this is, although it's an old dish, but culture needs to change. If you change today, we can still save sharks. If you don't change today, the sharks will disappear maybe 30, 40 years. And if the sharks are gone, what's going to happen to our oceans? It's a chain, right? You take out too many of the building blocks, everything starts falling apart. When our oceans fall apart, we're going to have trouble. Because you know, the surface of the earth, about 70% of that is ocean and water. This gives us the water that we drink, and the atmosphere, the weather that we use, it even gives us the oxygen that we breathe. So we really need to look after the ocean, which is why we need to control our plastics. And again, you know, we talk about carbon, carbon emission. If you burn plastics, if you are not careful with using your gas or diesel, carbon emission, what does carbon do? So, you know, for me, I'm not originally, I'm not a scientist, I'm an artist, I'm a fine art artist. Then I went into acting, come on, science is tough for me. But then it was explained to me in such a way that was easy to understand. What carbon does, it goes into the air, it comes down with the rain, and what it does to the ocean water is that it turns it into acid, acidification. Now, if you want to see what acidification does, you go home, you get some vinegar, you put it in a cup. You go find a seashell or something, you put it in there. You wait a week, you see what happens. It will melt, it will erode the seashells. So if the water, if the ocean water has too much acid, then things that have shells, like crabs and shrimps and everything like that, even corals, would have a very hard time growing, or it just won't grow at all. So which is why we have to be very careful now. So now back to um, how I got into all of this. Um, Shark Fin, I spoke with uh, Dr. Earl, who invited me to join her group. And I looked at her and I said, wait a minute, the people in your group are all scientists. I'm just some actress from Hong Kong. What do you think I can do? It was very intimidating. Because these people, you, know, you start talking to them, you're like, whoa, wait a minute, what are you talking about? Right? So um, she explained to me that each and every single one of us contribute differently. And because I'm an actress, I would be able to reach people easier. And you know, if I can understand the science and the math, then translate it into something that everyone can understand and try to get the message out there. Because she said the most difficult thing now about conservation is getting everybody involved. And having everyone realize that each and every one of us are so important to making a difference. So I joined her and we started making more waves. So after Shark Fin being based in Hong Kong, I thought, what else can we do in Hong Kong? So we banned the Hong Kong elephant army trade. That was not easy. I got um, you know, calls like threats and, and all kinds of things happened. It was quite nasty, but we managed in the end to ban the elephant ivory trade because we were killing about 100 elephants a day. And elephants take over 600 days to gestate and they have a life as long as humans. So we were killing them too fast for them to grow. So that had to stop. Anyway, um, after uh, elephants, Species by species, we keep trying to educate. Now, what can you do at home? I mean, really, I think you can control the plastic use. Sometimes you can talk to your friends. Maybe um, you go shopping, you know, use recyclable bags. But um, I think also, you know, being in your position, sometimes it's kind of tough. I, I really can understand that. I have two housekeepers helping me at home. One just went home yesterday, and she'll be gone for a month and a half. She hasn't seen her two boys for about three years because of COVID. I, I feel so bad about it, you know? So give her a longer vacation, and she needs to go back. And it's a good thing, it's a blessing that her boys haven't turned bad. They're, they're good boys. So they're always FaceTiming at night, and I say hi to them. But you know, they're good boys. Um, but really, I, mean, I understand it's a tough job. And for my housekeepers, the worst part is uh, they don't really have to look after me. It's the animals. <laughs> I mean, I have about roughly 60 birds. Wow. That is a lot of bird cages. Wow. That's a lot of poop. <laughs> I, every day there's lots of trays of poop, okay? So that's, that's not a good thing. 
And, um, and then, of course, I have turtles. Um, my big turtle that's out in my yard is something I can sit on it and she can still walk. Oh. She is an Aldabra. So when she poops, they're like hamburgers. Ah. And every day she poops. And every day she eats. But she's very cute. She has a very big, like it's a dog bowl. She eats from a dog bowl. Big red dog bowl. So she's very eager. In the morning, she knocks on our, there's a glass panel to the garden. And she just waits there. <laughs> and then you come with a red bowl. She's like, oh wow, she's so excited. <laughs> and you can wash her. You can bathe her, give her a shower, scratch her neck. She just stretches out. She loves people. And uh, so, you know, I've, two, I've got a couple of grandkids now. They come by and they feed the turtle, and, and everyone loves the turtle. But um, still, it's a lot of maintenance. And when you're doing a job, sometimes you feel that your employers really don't necessarily okay, have it. We're out? Yeah, maybe. It's fine. Okay. Well, maybe I don't need it. Yeah, okay. Sorry. I'll just do it without. Yeah, okay. So when you're doing a job, often you feel that you're not appreciated by your employers. Um, I know that sometimes you know, I'm in a hurry, I try to say thank you, I try to, like, now that one helper is away, I'm like, you don't have to cook dinner. I either cook it or I arrange for dinner to be here, you know, because it's just too much work otherwise. But not everyone is considerate. I know that yes. there's a lot of employers that are terrible. They think that you're machines. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And they expect you to be able to do everything. Mm -hmm. Now, when this happens, I actually believe that if you have pets in the house, they are a blessing. Yeah. Because they are innocent, they are pure, yeah. and they always appreciate you. Yeah. So yeah, the relationship that you have with the pet that you have at home is actually usually a much better relationship than yes. with your employers. Yes, yes. <laughs> and if you do a good job, the pets love you more than they love your employers. Yes. That's fine, you know? So that's really important. Yes. So I think, you know, when, when you're here in Hong Kong and you're looking after pets at home, it's really better than not having a pet in the house. Yes. You know, I, that's what I think. I, I know some people that don't like animals. I can't understand them because I was born with animals. Like when I was a baby, I had a dog sleeping in my bed with me already. You know, my father was one of the founders at Ocean Park. Wow. So I grew up with, you know, swimming with the dolphins and there was a seal in my bathtub once because it was sick and they had no room. Ah, let's not go there. So, so I'm used to having lots of animals and I can't really understand people that are like, ew, get that away. Ooh, it smells, it's gonna bite. But there are a lot of people like that in Hong Kong. And when I see that, I feel sorry for them. Because they have a, a different upbringing and they will never experience the joy of a relationship with an animal, which is personally a much better relationship than with a lot of people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah.